Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Zema, clinical psychologist specializing in transgender care. Welcome to my channel. Today, I'd like to discuss with you how uh, anxiety and depression are linked to gender dysphoria. Specifically, I'd like to discuss with you why uh, anxiety and depression tend to be linked to gender dysphoria, how one tends to increase when you're dealing with gender dysphoria, or actually how one tends to go up um, as you start dealing with gender dysphoria, and as well as how to distinguish when uh, potentially your anxiety or your depression is linked to gender dysphoria, or when it is linked to something else, or perhaps even stand alone issues that's going on. This is something that's incredibly common. Uh, you probably have heard me speak about the link between, definitely heard me speak about the link between anxiety and gender dysphoria, as well as the link between depression as well. It is so, so common that I have yet to see any individual that ha is struggling with gender dysphoria and at the same time doesn't have some element of anxiety or doesn't have some element of depression. Um, one can easily say that gender dysphoria in of itself is not a single standalone cluster diagnosis, but also has those two additional depression anxiety tied to it. This is just how incredibly, incredibly common to it. To the point where I see individuals wonder whether they have social anxiety or people develop social anxiety or they perceive they have developed standalone social anxiety uh, potential issue when it's really stemming from gender dysphoria. So let's uh having said all of that let's unpack that a little bit here today to help you understand what you might be struggling with on a daily basis and how this is all interconnected a lot of times when we have an understanding how things work and uh, why you're feeling more anxious and more depressed on some days it may really help you um, deal with it better it can really help you find a way to cope with it better once you have that understanding that understanding is really really important so let's start with depression Here's one of the things that I think it would be really important to clarify and for you, if you're not aware of this, to really uh, be familiar with. Depression is um, a spectrum in itself, really. Uh, there's different uh, degrees and severities of depression. There is, to simplify, there is what I call um, clinical depression. What is clinical depression? Clinical depression is when an individual really having a chemical imbalance, some kind of chemical neurological imbalance, perhaps they don't have enough serotonin levels, so perhaps something else is going on, where because it's such a chemical imbalance uh, in your set of yours, the way your mind works, instead of your pathways, it leads you to... Um, really struggle on a daily basis to the point where you have inability to feel any pleasure, inability to feel happiness, inability to get excited, um, hence the depression, hence the depressed mood. Clinical depression oftentimes manifests where an individual gets to the point where they can't even get out of bed. They can't even take care of their hygiene. Uh, they can't even take care of themselves. Uh, that's, of course, really severe end of depression. Sometimes, a lot of times, individuals exhibit and suffer from suicidal thoughts. So clinical depression is, it's important for us, it's this chemical imbalance. And uh, to help individuals struggling with chemical or clinical depression, uh, we oftentimes use a combination of psychotherapy as well as uh, uh, psycho psychotropic medications such as antidepressants. Now, the simplest, most banal way to distinguish if somebody has clinical depression or not, because you have to realize we live in a world today where we use those words uh, depressed and anxious as common language, common terms. Sometimes we wake up and nothing really going on with us, but we're having a bad day and we come across our coworker and we say, oh, I'm just feeling so depressed or, or I'm feeling so anxious. As a result, a lot of those words really lost their clinical significance. And for people who are really, really struggling with chemical imbalance in their brain, it can be really, really difficult because they oftentimes get really misunderstood or they oftentimes get really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they get dismissed as somebody who's really not, being, not uh, having a depression when in truth, clinical depression is really it, it's just it, it's really debilitating it's really really difficult the most banal way to distinguish if one has it when i have clients tell me oh I'm, I'm really really clinically depressed i often ask them well if what's your favorite comedy movie and they'll tell me is the name of the movie and i say if you were to watch it right now would you uh, laugh at the jokes and 
or if you can watch right now, would you be laughing at the jokes? And the truth is, if you're sitting there and you're watching your favorite comedy and you're able to laugh at the jokes, that's not a clinical depression because uh, you are able to make those connections. Your your brain pathways are wiring all in right place and you're able to recognize something that's humorful or funny and you laugh at it. Uh, clinical depression is, like I said, can be really, really painful for a lot of individuals. The reason why I'm distinguishing with all of you is because there's clinical depression. Remember, I said depression is a whole spectrum. And one of the things on the spectrum, apart from clinical, which is really severe um, form of depression, there is also a situational depression. Remember how some of you heard seasonal depression, when people get depressed during certain uh, times of the year. Situational depression is similar in the sense that you feel depression or elements of depression, sadness and grief, because you're going through a particular situation in your life. As a result, the depression, the symptoms of depression revolve around this particular situation and your relationship to the situation. So let me give you an example. If I today were to um, lose my job, it's a stupid example because I'm self-employed, but let's say that I couldn't do transgender care anymore. I couldn't be a psychologist anymore. That's a drastic situation that drastically changes my, my environment. And as a result, I will definitely be depressed. I probably will be depressed maybe for weeks or months. I don't know. I mean, hopefully not. I don't think I will be, but um, I will feel really sad. Every time I'll think about the loss of my job, I'll feel really, really sad. It'll take me down. But I'll still will be able to get out of bed, take care of myself. Um, other areas of my life, I still might be able to enjoy to some or greater or lesser degree. But when it comes to my job, or lack of job in this case, I will definitely feel a element of depression. That's a situational depression. Situation happened and you are feeling temporarily depressed as a result of that situation. The reason why it's important to distinguish between the two is because oftentimes when people are experiencing depression, in combination with gender dysphoria, it is because that is also situational depression that is tied to gender dysphoria. A lot of times individuals will come to me and they will express I'm feeling anxiety and depression, among other things, and also gender dysphoria. Sometimes their family members, for these adult individuals, will ask me, well, maybe they're just depressed. Maybe it's really not gender dysphoria. It's the other way around. It is often the situation of the gender having gender dysphoria, struggling with gender dysphoria that causes and increases depression. The same thing with anxiety, right? So we have generalized anxiety uh, diagnosis that is a clinical diagnosis. And then we have all of these uh, different uh, variations of uh, anxiety. And of course, within those variations, uh, within those variabilities of how anxiety tends to manifest, we also have anxiety in relationship to certain situations. In regards to gender dysphoria, people often will have increased anxiety too. Why will you have increase of anxiety in depression and in, uh, or why would you have increased in depression and anxiety in regards to gender dysphoria? Because when you're not comfortable with your gender, when you're not comfortable with how the world sees you and how the world genders you, when everything about your physicality, which is so, so important, something that is really being undermined in terms of its significance, because you navigate the world in this vessel. This is like a vehicle that you navigate the world with, through. Not only is it a vehicle, this vehicle is being labeled constantly by the world. When the world labels this vehicle with the names or terms or words that does not resonate with you, not only does it not resonate with you, it is something that gives you severe discomfort. You're going to A, try to avoid social situations that cause a discomfort. That's just how humans operate. When we deal with situations that make us feel uncomfortable, we're going to seek to avoid the situation. So as a result, you start to minimize how when you go out, and as a result, your isolation goes up. As your isolation goes up, now your social anxiety goes up. This is why people feel like, oh, I'm just such an introvert. No, a lot of people are not introverts. You feel like you're introvert because you don't want to push yourself out there. Because when you put yourself out, there's a the world misgenders you, and it's too much for you to bear. So as a result, anxiety goes up. The more anxiety goes up, the more you isolate. The more you isolate, the more depression goes up. The more depression goes up, the more you sit at home and you don't go out anywhere. They're very, very, very correlated. 
one time I talked to somebody, um, I was consulting with somebody on the phone and uh, they said, well, I also struggle with a lot of anxiety and my parents, this was young adult, by the way, and my parents are wondering, maybe this gender issues are just anxiety. Here's a question I asked them, which will help a lot of you who are struggling with anxiety and gender issues at the same time. I asked them this question. Now, um, do you feel most anxiety? Do you feel anxious um, when you go out there? Yes. What is it that causes you anxiety when you go out there? It's because how people see me. It's because people misgender me. What about when you come home and you are at home around your siblings and your parents and they're being supportive? How do you feel then? I don't feel anxious at all. Why don't you feel anxious at home? Because there's nobody who misgenders me. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Uh, dysphoria in this case is a linkage that creates a situation that increases somebody's anxiety. It's not that this person by themselves, in of itself, have anxiety. It's that anxiety is a direct relationship and indirect um, correlation or linkage to gender dysphoria. And if this person were to go out and be gendered the way they see themselves, they wouldn't have anxiety. This is why when they're at home and everybody respects their pronouns and respect their gender and respect who they are, they don't suffer with anxiety. But the minute they get themselves out there, they start having situational anxiety. The same thing with depression. Um, you can ask yourself, is my depression, um, am I experiencing a lot of depression when I am, for example, doing some things that has nothing to do with gender issues? Um Am I still experiencing depression or is that my depression tends to go up, especially when it has to do with something, the situation in the context of gender and in the context of being seen particular gender. Those two, anxiety and depression, are incredibly linked to gender dysphoria, often like a, they're like a, a married uh, polyamorous relationship. Uh, that the whole three of them having that they cohabit and exist together and unfortunately they can model a lot of things because uh, I believe I did a video on a vicious cycle of gender dysphoria where I talked about this where I talked about how one thing tends to go up and then another thing tends to go up and then as a result this is also goes up so they tend to kind of play off on each other when we get anxious a lot of times we inevitably get depressed because anxiety is unpleasant and because we're anxious we try to minimize situations that cause anxiety which a lot of times has to do with isolation and the depression. So you see how they tend to really play on each other. Um, do I see people who have anxiety and depression standalone issues apart from gender dysphoria? Yes. Usually what happens is that when people start uh, their gender transition, they start working on their gender issues, if the anxiety and depression doesn't start to diminish and just tends to... Um, be there and be present there across the boards in completely uh, regardless of whether it's in the context of gender or not, then we know we're dealing here with something else. But for a lot of people, it is so closely tied to their gender dysphoria. It is so closely tied to going out and doing things. Now, if, and I'm not even going to say if, because I know a lot of you are struggling with anxiety and depression as well as gender dysphoria, because if you have gender dysphoria, chances are you have having the other too. What do I usually recommend? People ask me this all the time. W wouldn't it be helpful if I went on antidepressants? That's really more for the, a medical doctor to decide. I, I can prescribe from a psychologist. Uh, a psychiatrist would be a better person to answer that question. But I'll share with you my opinion. My opinion is that because it is situational anxiety and depression, I don't think it warrants to introduce a pharmaceutical intervention that will add complexity to to your neurochemistry what i recommend is the best the best anti-anxiety and antidepressant and this is going to sound like something you heard a million times before the best anti-anxiety and antidepressant out there is exercise it doesn't even have to be getting on a bike and getting a very rigorous um, exercise it can be something as simple as walking 20 to 20 minutes a day it's the best way to clear your head. It's the best way to increase your endorphins. It's the best way to increase your serotonin levels. It's just, it's such a great, great way. It's such a great thing for your chemistry. So I usually just recommend that. I don't recommend an intervention of pharmaceuticals also because for a lot of you, you're going to be considering going on hormones and hormones in of itself are going to introduce, um, they're going to change uh, the way 
you may start seeing things, perceiving things, feeling things, because you're going to change your hormonal system. If you are lowering your testosterone and increasing your estrogen, that's also going to shift how you see and how you feel and relate to things. Same thing if you're lowering your estrogen by taking testosterone, that's also going to shift things within you. So for that reason, I say, if you're already taking hormones and you are already trying to further understand yourself, let's not introduce pharmaceuticals at this point. Um, let's just deal with you really getting aligned with yourself, especially not to mention that once people start really dealing with their gender issues, there's depression and anxiety tends to go down or tends to go away. Like I said before, a lot of you think that you are uh, introverts, when in reality, you're not introverted. In reality, uh, you are just isolating yourself because it's too painful to be out there and too painful to, to meet individuals who may potentially misgender you. A lot of people, once they start really getting comfortable and confident about their gender identities, end up feeling more confident and more comfortable going out there. Hence, they start realizing, oh my God, I'm really actually not an introvert at all. I actually enjoy socializing. Who wouldn't enjoy socializing if you're being seen for who you are? Of course, everybody's going to hate socializing with other human beings when they don't see you for who you are. Also, when people are being hateful, when also people are being judgmental. I would want to be strong. I would want to isolate. So if you're right now withdrawing and isolating, don't be really hard on yourself. The goal is not to put yourself out there in order to reduce your anxiety and depression. Chances are, if you're isolating, you're probably doing coping. You're probably doing what you feel the best is to, to minimize the pain that you feel. But realize that this is probably because you either, A, need to start taking care of your gender dysphoria and start finding a way to deal with it, or B, you need to also start taking affirming steps so that your confidence can increase and you also can feel much better as a result of it. But this is how depression and anxiety are commingled. Like I said, they're like in this polyamorous relationship with, um, with gender dysphoria, very, very linked. I see this all of the time, uh, almost impossible for me to see anybody who doesn't have uh, depression and anxiety while struggling with gender dysphoria and gender dysphoria is a byproduct of it oftentimes uh, that i tend to see of course there's a, you some of you out there um, who struggle with depression who struggle with clinical depression on top of struggling with gender dysphoria who struggle with general anxiety on top of struggling with gender dysphoria and that's really difficult and really hard when you're going through all of the things and when you're trying to better your health, it's, it's just really, really overwhelming. So my heart completely goes out to you. Um, and it's important to recognize that when it's talking about clinical uh, anxiety and depression, those things are, gosh, they're, they're way tougher than uh, situational. And so I, you know, in that case, um, yeah, you have to do what's best for you. Uh, but I don't want in any shape or form minimize what you're going through because like I said, we live in a world where everybody's saying, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. And then when they see somebody who is even, for example, has to be in disability because they're having such rehabilitating clinical depression, people look at them and sometimes judge them and say that lazy or, or you're really not depressed. But clinical depression is a real thing. And it is it, it's horrific. I've seen and I've worked with clients who had clinical depression and let me tell you, it is painful to witness. Uh, it is painful to see a person who is so absent of any emotion or effect. And it's just really, it's, it's, it's nobody should, should go through that. So comment below, let me know. Are you struggling with anxiety and depression? How do they commingle together for you? What did you do? Did your isolation go up? And as a result, also your depression went up. Uh, how you're doing now? Have you started gender transition? If that's something you wanted to do, have you noticed your anxiety and depression decreasing as you started your gender transition? Comment below. Love reading your comments. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.